Thanks an apology today, a late apology. This meeting is being recorded. What, Michael is there, or if he can't do it, I can do it. Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> a quick care care would be nice. Morning, Matt. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll, I'll do the code for you again. Uh, Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Ki a mā kine ki uta. Ki a mā tāra tāra ki tai. Ehi aki ana te atikura. He tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihe mauri ora. Okay. Well, thank you. Now, we've... Uh... We'll, I guess we'll just stick directly to the time frame we've got here. Um, I'm just wondering, is it Rene is it here with us today or not? Our new member? Oh, I lost you. I cannot see her on the list of participants at the moment. No, hang on a minute, maybe we a bit of problem here with the cell phone, it's not being very easy to work on because it's not much of a screen. <laughs> Just coming in by the looks. Kia ora. There we are. Kia ora. Kia ora. Right, there we go. Now, hopefully you can see me. <laughs> All right. Um, so if that's the case, we'll just, we'll, we'll hold that off. Um, any other apologies apart from Richard? Uh, obviously, Kieran, is that right? Yes, yes he's just emailed this morning. He's um, doing the uh, tuna trapping and transfer. Okay. Any other further apologies? If that's not the case, we'll, uh, we'll carry on. Um, the minutes of the last meeting, is there anything that anybody, anybody would like to bring up with that? Just... Just before we do that, Simon, you probably missed the conversation earlier, but we just thought we might make a um, special mention of the passing of Ross McRoby. And um, also, um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware that Peter Ramsden um, passed away on the 3rd of February, uh, who is, yeah, um, it's, will be known to a few people. Yeah, it's great sadness. We've, that's two, two of our original people involved with this committee, and um, we've got to know them as friends, really, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, it was a shock for both. And um, I think especially Ross, because one moment he's with us, the next minute he's not there. So it's really, really sad. And uh, I hope we've conveyed our condolences to their families, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, that has been done. But um, so we'll, we'll have a moment of silence, please. Thank you, everyone. I think everybody feels the same. It's a, he's, he's, he's left, they've both left the void in our, our committee. Um, sorry to admit uh, that. I'm trying to do everything on my knee today. Minutes. Um, is there anything that needs to be brought up on the minutes that anybody's seen as worthy of, uh, of correcting or anything? Is this just correction or matters arising, uh, Simon? Sorry, say again. Is this just is this just uh, corrections or yeah, just, just correct, discuss correction. or discussions yeah, but, matters arising? I oh, know we'll, we'll discuss in a moment, but it's just wondering if there's anything there that okay. anybody's picked up. No, any, okay. Well, if everybody's happy with that. What about matters arising? Yeah, I have, but we'll let committee members go first. If the, anyone ha has anything, yeah, sure. Any other one comments? No, you go ahead. Okay, um, ju just the minutes from last meetings that uh, 5.4 about uh, removing trout from Lake Middleton and introducing eels. Um, without, without going into lots of detail, 
I've talked to all the agencies that have been involved in it and pretty much there's no support for either of those projects. So rather than that one, that, that one um, perhaps dragging on for a long time, perhaps you just nip those two in the bud. There's a whole lot of political, environmental, statutory reasons why removing trout or introducing eels can't, can't happen, basically. Right. Thank you for that. We'll note that. Any Cheers. further? Is, he, is that you, you Karen, with you with us now? No? Oh, it's just Michael's there. Okay. So anything else we need to bring up on in, in regard to that? We're moving on. Just, sorry. Oh, Again, sorry. Please. Just, just yeah. Um, just um, regarding the Love of Lakes campaign, um, Kate, Kate might come back next month, give an update on that to the committee. Okay, thanks for that. Cool. Kate's done a mar marvelous job of that. I think everybody has chatted about it, so it has had some effect. That's for sure. Um, there's been a lot of people around the lakes this year, and it appears that um, you know, I, th I think it's improved. There's less trash and rubbish around, and I think people are trying harder. Which is great. Right. Uh, no, no further matters arising. If that's the case, I, I, is Sean with us and Tracy? Is they? <coughs> yeah, I am. Can you hear me, right? Yes, we can. Awesome. Um, so, kia ora. I'm Sean Thomason from um, Lens and Senior Vice and Biodiversity Advisor. Um, I have uh, Tracy here with me today, who's my manager. She uh, looks after the aquatic program, but I'll let her introduce herself when she starts. So I'll just um, screen share um, so I can show you the presentation that we have. Um, we'll have. I guess we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. So it'll be a second. I'm just sorting my technology. That's all right. Well, um, Sean's sorting out his technology. I, I guess I can then just start by introducing myself. So, um, uh, kia ora everyone. I'm Tracy Burton. Um, I have um, come into the role as manager of the biosecurity biodiversity team um, back in uh, August now. So, um, coming approaching the six uh, month mark. Um, while I'm new to this position within LINS as Biosecurity Biodiversity Manager, um, prior to my role at LINS, I was a scientist um, at NIWA for the last 20 um, plus years and um, as a freshwater ecologist there. So my main role was looking at the ecological condition of lakes throughout the country um, with um, the primary focus being on aquatic plant management and biosecurity issues in the lakes. So I'm very much at home with these. Lakes, and in fact, one of my very first jobs at uh, NIWA um, in the aquatic space was right back around the 2001, maybe even 2000 mark, where I was asked to um, head down to the South Island to your region there and just have a look at Buscot Station and the winery where there had um, been an infestation of Lagrosiphon uh, present. So I feel like I've um, sort of grown and seen this this um, infestation that you have done in the lakes from from the start there. Um, yeah, Sean, sorry, I've um, got Sean controlling the slides today. So if you hear me, just um, ask him to flick over, you'll, you'll know what I'm doing. Um, yeah, so um, I've come into LINS as the functional lead for the aquatics con um, control program, the Lake Week control program here. Uh, we supported in the aquatic space with our advisor, um, Brit, Brittany Abels, who some of you might have had some um, dealings with in the, in the past few years. So um, I don't think you all need an introduction to Lagrosiphon. I'm sure you're all very well aware of it um, being on the lakes, on the side of the lakes there. I guess the key things I did want to just note about the weed, which really just highlights the, the complexities of, of managing this weed is that, um, yes, uh, Lagrosiphon um, is known as, as oxygen weed, invasive to New Zealand. And um, what you might not know is that there's only female plants of Lagrosiphon in New Zealand. And that's quite, um, that, that's quite different to what is in other countries. Um, but what that means is that its reproduction is primarily entire, well, entirely through vegetation frag fragmentation. So that means every time one of those little pieces of that plant is breaking off, even a piece the size of my thumb, 
um, as long as it's got a live node on it, it'll quite actively um, keep growing. And of course, because it's breaking off and growing in these fragments, as we all know, um, it's it's really spread very easily through through human activities, um, spreading that that weed around. Uh, first seen in New Zealand in 1950, and it came in through the pond and aquarium trade. Uh, first recorded in Canterbury in 1961 in the Christchurch Avon River, and um, this weed is currently on our rank, let's say, uh, third worst uh, um, submerged weed in New Zealand, just because of its um, the extent that it can grow down to. So this weed we're looking at um, can grow up to five metres high, uh, forming those, those dense be beds that some of you might have seen, and it's growing down to 6.5 metres deep. Now, the good thing about that measure is that the native plants, the indigenous native plants that we have growing in our lakes um, in the Waitaki region are of course growing down to around the 16 to 19 metre mark. So it means that while we've still got the lagrosiphon in the lake system, we've still got the opportunity for plants to be growing beyond the lagrosiphon when the water conditions and that's the clarity and that allows. And that's a really key thing because if we at some stage have one of the, the weeds that are worse, such as Ageria, which is already in the Canterbury region and Hornwort that's currently only um, in the North Island come down to these regions. These plants can grow deeper. And if we had Hornwort come into the system, um, we would have a complete washout of any um, indigenous vegetation um, that's currently left in those systems. So of course, just highlighting the importance there of um, ensuring that we, we control these weeds and keep up our really good hygiene to ensure that nothing else gets in. Uh, Lagrosiphon, of course, is an unwanted organism and um, it maintains that status uh, through the region. Oh, sorry, Sean, if we can just flick to the next slide. Uh, so given the current extent of Lagrosiphon in Lake Benmore, um, the objective of eradication on a system level just isn't possible. There's just too much of it there. And so instead, a strategy of progressive containment um, is aimed at preventing the downstream spread for as long as possible, as well as safeguarding the other water bodies in the catchment. Um, as well as um, focusing on, on the pro progressive containment of lagrosiphon in the, those key areas, um, we're also looking very closely at surveillance. So just keeping a good eye on where it is, which allows us to be able to react early should we need to, and also evaluate our control methods a bit more we're targeting the high amenity areas. So those areas where there are people swimming and accessing the water via boats and trailers and the lights to prevent that spread. And part of that is working closely with the Check Clean Dry campaign as well. Um, the photo up on the um, right hand side there is one that um, Niwa has supplied us from their last uh, check in the lake. And that's one of the divers swimming through the water there doing a check with a bed of lagrosiphon growing underneath them. And you can also see um, the bottom photos there just showing the, the plants of lagrosiphon. And on the right, it's hard to see, but there's actually um, native plants um, with lagrosiphon growing amongst it. Thanks, Sean. That's all right. So, um, for today, I've just pulled together these slides here, just showing that, and that you've probably seen very similar slides before, just showing what our overall strategy in Lake Benmore is. So we have the sustained control that is occurring in the Ahuru Delta, uh, um, the arm and into zones four and three. And we have progressive, progressive containment occurring in zones uh, two and eradication, uh, oh, sorry, two and one now, and eradication in uh, zones um, one, well, and downstream into the Holden Bay um, and Lake Aviemore area, which is the yellow bordered areas there. Uh, next one, please, Sean. Cool. So I've just included this slide just to showcase the type of control methods that we're currently using in Lake Benmore to control the, the lagrosiphon. So we're using uh, herbicide, uh, diquat, um, of course, this is the, the most effective um, herbicide that we currently have in New Zealand for diquat. Uh, it's, it's safe, it meets all of our regulations, and it's having a really great result in some of those areas, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, in areas, so let, the, the good thing about um, herbicide, of course, is it really is our only option for controlling large weed beds. 
So it's going to have that impact where it's affecting the photosynthetic, um, the way that the plant can photosynthesize, and therefore it's um, killing them um, quite quickly in those large situations. When we have areas where we've got stool water uh, flow and it's suitable, we can also look at things such as benthic barriers. And in this case here in the middle photo, you're seeing a hessian product, which is essentially like a big piece of um, weed mat that you might lay on your garden at home. And it's doing exactly what you would expect on land as well. It's actually shutting out the light and preventing any plants from being able to grow. So essentially smothering them out and killing them beneath it. And then where we've got low occurrence of the weed, so this would be more in our eradication zone areas, we're also using diver control to hand weed out the individual plants. And um, you can see there that a diver is swimming over some of the shorter native um, plant, plant communities and um, putting the, the agrosiphon plant that, that I've found into the bag. And, if, and you can imagine they've got to be very careful when they're doing it um, through this process because you can't um, afford to have even just a small part of that plant break off and float away to create another um, infestation. Uh, also just wanted to point out um, that these that the control program that we're carrying out is not just funded by LINS, but also Meridian Energy contributes to that. And we have in-kind support from a lot of other agencies as well, including ECAN, Genesis, Energy, Department of Conservation, Fish and Game, and, and um, the district councils too, whether that be in-kind support through um, publicising um, what's, what's happening, right down to carrying out surveillance and also monitoring of the lakes as well. Right, so moving on to uh, sustained control. Um, so um, as you all know, we've, we've had the, the highest densities of Hornwall, um, sorry, Lagrosiphon is going to be up at the head area of that lake, so up at the Ahuri Delta and coming into the Ahuri. Um, so we've got that flow from left to right as it moves through the system, through the arm there and into the, into the neck. So in these areas, um, the, in the Ahuri Delta and the Arm, these were treated eerily with the herbicide Diquat in May 2021. So NIWA did their inspections back in December. So essentially seven months after NIWA had done its um, inspection, it produces, it has, the NIWA divers have gone in there and they've rated um, the sites around the lake there that you can see marked with a little cross and that's the sites where the divers have gone in and they've provided a rating for what the weed looked like at those particular locations. So they've ranked them from a zero to a five, which you can see in that herbicide rating scale there. The herbicide rating scale essentially means that zero, there was no damage to the plants, um, with one being the growth check of the abscess, like you, you can still see the plant growing away right down to a four and a five, which is where we're saying that essentially the plants are looking like they've got lesions, they've lost their, their side shoots, they're defoliating, and a five is a complete, the bed has collapsed and um, partial kill of the plant. So in that area, 92 hectares uh, was treated in the delta in the shoreline arm. Um, overall, um, they actually had an excellent herbicide outcome from the last season. Um, the treatment in the Delta and the Arm were effective and um, were really good at substanti substantially just reducing the overall um, lagrosiphon cover and height in that area. So that was a great result from the last season. Um, you'll see uh, sailors cutting marks down there. There was a couple of sites surveyed there. Um, they had a couple of mixed results, good, over, good outcome at the head of the bay, um, and along the margins, the herbicide damage was variable, ranging from patches of defoliation, where the, that meaning that where the plants had lost their leaves, um, to areas where there was no weed seen around the immediate boat ramp area. So that's, um, that was really good. Uh, the boat ramp area, as I just mentioned, there was a great result seen there overall. Um, with reduced height and cover of the labrosiphon, and I'll show you what that'll look like in a moment as well. Um, no, no weed was seen around the immediate area surrounding the boat ramp, um, and the stream inflow had surface reaching beds, um, which were um, assessed as a bit of a moderate risk to hygiene, so that's an area to watch. Um, then we're moving into the neck, and the neck is always going to be a, a bit of a difficult area. 
Um, so the herbicide treatment here aims to control the biomass just to, to minimize the, fra the fragments that could potentially spread down into the other parts of the lake. Um, control wasn't seen as being particularly effective in these areas, which was, a, which was um, disappointing um, with lagrosiphon recovery and expansion of lagrosiphon in those areas evident. Um, that could be for a number, number of reasons. We don't have an exact reason for that one, but it might have been um, things such as sediment covering the plants when the um, herbicide was applied, uh, the temperature of the water, how established they were at the time of spraying, um, even down to things down to the water chemistry and temperature. So um, that's just something to look at, not completely unexpected, but um, not as good a result as what we'd seen um, higher up there in the delta in the arm. Um, we can just go down another slide there, Sean. I've just um, included a picture here to the left, just showing the extent of the boat-based dicot application in, in uh, sailors cutting. Uh, and of course, the reason I'm focusing on this one is because we're also seeing this as a bit of a hygiene site. So we mean from that point of view that we're trying to keep that weed as free as possible, recognizing that there's a lot of trailer and boat movement in around the area that could potentially transfer lagrosiphon to other lake sites. So it's a key area for us to ensure that we're minimizing the risk of people being able to take any lagrosiphon out. Um, the photos on the right there are just a couple of examples just showing you the types of damage that we're seeing um, on the, on the lagrosiphon. While it looks quite healthy there at the top, and it is, it's happily growing away, but they are very short plants. And uh, so they've been shortened and they're very thin. They don't have the dense appearance that they would normally have. So, so while the um, dicot, of course, is effective, this is what we would expect. So it knocks the plants down, but they can very quickly recover. They're still short here though, and um, you can see in the bottom picture there the weed bed actually has collapsed and those fragments are laying against the sediment there. Um, moving down to the progressive containment slide. We're really hitting that, that gooseneck area there in zones one and two, and that provides us a, a, a much higher level of complexity when we're looking at control because there's lots of nooks and crannies as you can imagine it where the plants can actually um, get caught and when they're flowing so they're flowing through this this gooseneck system and they're able to um, they're they're presenting themselves in all those areas where they're sheltered and they can get um, stuck and quite happily grow away in the um, small bays and things in the area so the control works in zones one and two um, have created that the reason that this zone was created, created was to create a buffer zone between the lagrosiphon infected areas in the Ahuri Arm and Delta, um, and of course downstream. So we're really wanting just to keep on top of that to prevent any fragmentation flowing through. Um, overall in zone one, we had a really good outcome of um, control um, and have maintained low biomass of the lagrosiphon with just a few scattered plants uh, still present. Uh, and in the zone two there, there was a moderate to slight reduction in the biomass of the plants, but there was still significant cover noted underneath the pylons that were in that area. So a bit of a mixed bag there. Um, just moving down one more slide there, Sean, we're just moving into the eradication um, control works area there. So um, essentially the whole of the um, Holden Arm and Holden Bay down there. Um, and you can, you can see from there um, too on, on these maps, by the way, I should, should have pointed out. So as well as the crosses being the areas where the Niwa check had occurred, uh, the green areas there show where hand weeding was carried out. And there's um, some little blue areas there that would show where um, hisi and matting was used. Um, so the areas beyond the neck, um, are targeted for lagrosiphon um, eradication, as we just mentioned. Now, NEWA conducted the checks in this area um, at known points where there had been um, plants before or high risk areas for fragmentations. Um, th this was actually a pretty good result. So there was a good level of control. Uh, however, there was still more plants and of course we would like an eradication area, but they were but they were low. So there were fewer plants than had been detected though than over the last two years, which shows that we're still maintaining our ground in this area. So that's really good to, to know. And the area between the, the dam 
the boat ramp and the boom is still an area of concern with a large number of plants being detected in those areas. Um, and they continued just to make a note there too for interest sake that there were no plants detected in Lake Waitaki. So that's really what we've um, been looking at in terms of the control program for this year. And I've just included the slide here just to um, show you whereabouts we are um, and what's coming up next, I guess. So uh, currently we have got hand weeding being carried out in those eradication zones in February, and we've got another spray um, application happening in March, um, maybe into April. Again, it's, it's dependent on lake conditions and what the weed condition is looking like, whether it's clean enough to spray or not. Um, herbicide, the herbicide that we're using, Diquat, breaks down very quickly when it's um, introduced to any organic matter. So if we have any of the um, any organic matter covering those plants, if the Diquat hits that before it hits the plants, we'll have a much reduced result um, of being able to achieve any control. So that's where the late condition really is so important before we spray. Um, we will have um, Niwa carrying out another inspection um, in June, July, just based looking at what the outcomes were for the earlier monitoring. Um, we will be looking at carrying out um, stakeholder meetings in May, and this is really important. So we're not creating the um, control works planning on our own. We're really bringing in um, all the different agencies involved in the, in the lakes here to, to um, look at the sites, um, have a general understanding of what we consider would be the important sites to focus on and what, what strategy we are moving to next, what's, what's coming up. Uh, so um, that's, that's the, the real plan going up into May for the stakeholder meetings. Then we'll, we'll be sitting down to look at the control work planning side of things before cementing those plans, uh, sending them out for feedback. Uh, and moving ahead with the new season uh, of um, control works, which would start around the October um, time frame. And um, I hope I've covered everything that that might um, have been of interest there, but um, please feel free to fire any questions back at me. I saw one in the chat. Should we answer your questions before I? Um, well, well, yeah, thank you, I... Tracy. Is, is there any other any questions directly to Tracy before we move on? There's a couple of here in the chat. Yeah, I see that. So, yeah, we can. You can deal with those. <laughs> okay, sorry, Sean, I have I can't see them on the screen. I'm looking at. Oh, can you not see that? Sorry. I no, I, I can't. Sorry. Okay. Um, because Ligara siphon is female only and genetically the same, would it be more vulnerable to controls using gene silencing, RNA guided gene drives, or transgene use? Well, that, that's a big question. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not I'm not a specialist in that area, but I I, I don't think so. We're looking at at the different strains, and I, I don't I know that they're doing um, work overseas on that, but um, I, I personally don't know the answer to that. Sorry, I know it's a very robust plant. Um, gene editing is uh, is it's new territory, and I'm not familiar with whether that would be able to help or not. And the second question was, given that diquat accumulates in sediments, how well do native aquatic plants grow back into the treated areas? Oh, yeah, no, great. So um, the other thing I should have mentioned about diquat is it's a very, it's a very much a selective herbicide. So it actually only um, affects um, the invasive species. So the native plants um, that are either not affected or very mildly affected. So it's, it, it doesn't really affect them at all. And the other key thing to note about our, our native plants versus the invasives is that our um, natives produce seed. So these, the seed actually falls, in, falls into the sediment and creates what we call a native seed bank. And that seed bank can stay viable for about 10 years. So the reality is it makes it, it's one of the best things about our invasive plants, I guess, is that they don't produce seed. So once we can remove them from an area, even if we're leaving behind a barren landscape, the seed bank from the native plants that were previously there will very quickly be able to recolonize and come back if um, they weren't there previously. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I think you can move on then, Sean, if there's no other questions. Awesome. So uh, bear with me for a second. I'll just bring up my notes so I can. My question. 
Hi, Elizabeth. Yeah, I've had, had my little yellow hand up for a while. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I don't think anyone can see it. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so, so my question is, is around the dicot. Um, so, uh, yeah, so dicot, um, yeah, it, it, it binds quite strongly to the soil particles, so it's, it's really good because it doesn't get into the water column and that. Um, it doesn't particularly break down according to the EPA. So um, what I would look, like to know is uh, what um, measures of the sediments in those lakes do you take for dicot? Do you monitor the dicot levels in the sediments? And are the sediments, um, you know, say in flood conditions, um, uh, if they're disturbed by any means, you know, where are they going? Um, so my understanding is that they don't, don't break down as quick in the sediments, but they certainly break down. So they, I, I believe they're non-traceable. And again, I'd have to go back and check the, the facts on this one, but my understanding is that they're pretty much non-traceable within a, a period of time. I don't have that period of time on me now, but it might be 72 hours to a, a week or something like that. And again, I, I'd have to look at the, the facts. I don't have that on me, but my understanding is that there is no long-term effect in the sediments and it um, hasn't been something that we Could carry you please double check that? Yeah, I will. I can get back back. to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's um, Matt here. Uh, hey, that's Matt. my understanding too, Tracy. Um, yeah. There was uh, there's a piece of research published by NIWA following a dicot application in the Rotorua Lakes over the last 40 or 50 years, where there's been yeah. numerous uh, toxicology and sediment sample um, confirming the point you just made. Yeah, I can't remember the exact um, time frame, but I know that there has been extensive research done on dicot. It's not a new herbicide. It's been used in New Zealand for, gosh, over 50 years now and in and, and, and the States for a lot longer. So we're not dealing with a, a new chemical here that we're unfamiliar with. Tracy, can I just ask about yeah. um, the top of Lake Benmore? Um, mm. I've been boating up there recently and the, you know, the the oxygen weed, as I call it, is, is pretty thick everywhere. Um, yeah. But you sort of have concentrated further down and on the Ahariri arm. So is there anything happening at all up at the top end of the lake? Uh, so w when you're talking about the top end of the lake, sorry, are you talking up more around uh, the Ahariri um, Delta area? No, 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 not not the Ahariri. Oh, oh the, the one the up Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, sorry, it probably doesn't show it on there, but um, my understanding is that there's just surveillance and stuff up there, but I'll have to get back to you on that one, Joy, and confirm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we were down there, and I'm sure others of here have been down there, and it's and it's it's spreading fast, really fast. Yeah. Um, we flew over it um, some weeks back, and um, it's so noticeable from the ear now just how far it's gone down. Yeah, I, yeah, I can completely, yeah, completely hear you there, and it's, it's, a, it's one of those... Um, it's, it's just one of those situations that's really hard for us to manage because the reality is that oxygen weed is something that we're going to be living with now. Um, the best bet that we've got at the moment, because we can't eradicate it, is to control it, that sustained control, keeping it at those levels, low levels, preventing it from spreading because we don't want it to be in other lakes. But um, it, is, it, is a, it is a really difficult plant to manage and there, there's no easy answers to it. We're kind of like crossing our fingers that a, a tool is going to be developed, um, you know, while we're keeping it at bay that will allow us to, to hit it harder. But at the moment, we're using all the best tools in the toolbox and constantly evaluating them too. NIWA is currently um, carrying out different um, evaluations of control methods to ensure that we're kind of using the best possible tools that we can, but there is no easy answer to controlling it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Joy, I'm I'm not sure. Um, no, I, I've maybe. seen the weed proliferation in the same area as you. Um, love the same, love the lake for the same reason. Mm. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure that it's, it's actually Allegra siphon. Oh, There's, okay. Yeah, and it'd be. Uh, um, I, and Tracy, the weed surveillance that takes place on on the whole of the lake system does that does that include that particular area? Um, I'd have to go away and have a look at that one, Matt. I'm not sure, actually. I'm not familiar. Hmm. Oh, so I can I can double check that. Could you send that um, area to me um, so I can follow that one up after this meeting? But 
Um, the point that you just made there, Matt, about um, it potentially being another um, native plant species, uh, that is quite common at the moment, particularly at this time of the year when we have the potamagetans, which are another native species, tall growing species. They don't form the thick mats and, and the beds that the lagrosiphon does, but quite often um, people are reporting, thinking that they've got um, a weed such as lagrosiphon when it is the native um, potamagetans or milfoils instead. No, I think I'm pretty certain that what I was seeing was okay. oxygen weed, but um, yeah, I could be wrong. Um, I'm not a scientist. No, but um, take take a picture, um, uh, take a bit, and um, take a picture, Joy. I'd love to see it. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, and what, while I'm holding onto the talking stick a bit here, Tracy, um, mm. I was just looking at some of the mitigations, particularly those around educating the public. You know, the click, um, check, clean, dry. Uh, I, I'm I'm a recreational boat owner, and I confess, f frequently forget to do that myself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, uh, humans being imperfect creatures. Yeah. Um, I'm also just uh, you know we've we've got a rowing regatta taking place on Lake Rotana for now, and I think Marty Cup due in March with a with a bunch of boats coming down from the North Island. Mm. Is there is there any sort of thinking, you know, planning? In, intention to kind of strengthen our defences around the importation of other unwanted species because I've, I've seen hornwort in the Waikato Lake systems and yep. it'd be absolutely devastating if that turned up in our waterways. Yeah, it absolutely would. And um, so our contribution to that program is our advisor, um, Brittany, uh, attends those, those working groups, those steering group committees and things, sorry, and they are looking at um, the ways that they're communicating. So they've currently got um, some advocate programs and I'm not sure, um, being from the North Island myself, I'm not sure what's happening down in Canterbury at the moment, but um, there's regional uh, council representatives on that board that are looking at um, what communication is going out in those areas. They're looking at signage um, for people that are moving from the North Island down to South Island, they actually have check clean dry advocates on the ferry that are walking around talking to people, particularly anybody with a boat or um, obvious recreational equipment on their, on their vehicles. Um, they're around the lakes in the summer, just doing um, uh, surveys and the likes, just really trying to touch base with as many people as they can. I'm not sure how effective that is in all areas. And that, again, I haven't spent a lot of time around um, your lake, so I'm not sure what you might be seeing down there. Um, there, there is a lot happening in the in the background. It's just one of those hard ones because, like you said, you can get the information out there, but we just really need the the, the public put by. And there's been um, work done on looking at potentially putting more um, boat wash down stations in place before they enter these areas. And in fact, one of the really novel things that the Bay of Plenty Regional Council have done with their lakes um, in conjunction with the Tiara um, Lakes Trust up there, which is the iwi um, look that have the ownership of those lakes, is that they have put in a self-certification method now so that anybody that comes to one of the Rotorua lakes, they pull up at the boat ramp before they can put their boat in. There's a, um, a box attached to um, a sign at, near the boat ramp. They actually have to take the form out and they have to read through the form, it is just a tick box. So I'm sure there'll be some people, you know, that might just go through, tick through, not, not looking, but the, the reality is they have to take this form. Um, they say, yes, I've checked underneath my trailer. Yes, I've checked in my anchor well. You know, it's this kind of simple checklist. And then they're required to sign it and put it on their dashboard. Um, so that's kind of, you know, one, ex one um I was going to say extreme, but it's it's just a, a new way. But that's actually in line with what a lot of um, regional authorities do over in the states, particularly where they have the same sort of issues. They have, um, I mean, particularly in the Rotorua area, we've got one of the best Rotorua lakes, less than um, with no or very little invasive plants, actually just lagrosiphon, less than one um, one kilometer away from our worst Rotorua lake, being Lake Rotoahu which is completely saturated in hornwort. So there's those complexities while those two lakes are closer, um, you potentially have a lot more to lose. If you could, like you said, if you've got hornwort down there, it would be devastating. Um, so yeah, I, I just in, um, encourage you just to look at options down there as well, see what the signage is like, um, but it, it's really, it's, um, 
MPI that that lead this that we're contributing but not playing at on the grounds part of it. Mm. Well, thank you for that, Tracy. I think when uh, most of the rowing boats come down, they they've got to go down one bit of road just before they actually launch all the boats. So it'd be very easy yep. to set up something to check all those boats coming in from outside. Um, yeah. And in fact, I think that was done a few years ago when my daughters used to row. I remember taking boats in there and there was actually a, a spray station. So I don't know if that's still there, but we need to follow that one through. Yeah. And I think they are. And also the Czech Clean Dry advocates around the different regions are also staying on top um, and communicating with the rowing clubs and the likes. And they're also dealing directly with um, any event organisers. So if there are events organised in the area, you'll quite often see now that a large part of that registration process is around the Czech Clean Dry um, yeah. side of things. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. Simon, it looks like Michael might want to say something. Michael, have you had a question? Yeah. Is there outside contractors doing the work or is it the NIWA team doing the work? Yeah, so uh, we are using our biosecurity partner, which is by um, Bofferma School Limited, based in Christchurch. Um, they've been doing this work, uh, gosh, I think since at least around the 2011 mark. Um, so they're very familiar with the areas. They work in with um, Meridian and the likes too, just to ensure to, to arrange the timings and the likes. Um, so Boffa arranges the contractors. So no, they're not, um, of course, Linz and they're not Niwa, but we have um, that set up on purpose. So um, while Boffa and the school manages the contractors coming in and doing the work, uh, Niwa is independent of that process. So it comes in as an external party to monitor what has been happening and to assess the outcomes from the spray results. And, and when you say that it's, it's unachievable to get rid of it totally, mm. is that because of just how much it is or because of the cost? It's uh, a really Both. good question. Both. <laughs> um, look, I, um, I would say that um, it's, not, it's not feasible based on the current budgets that we have to eradicate um, lagrosiphon um, in the lakes as it is around the country at the moment um, with the tools that we have. So... Yes, I mean, if you threw all the money, you know, possible at, at a lake like that, it would be potential that we could go in and, you know, you could have divers working in that lake every day, hand pulling, weeding, suction dredging, all the likes. But remember, in, in a lake like that, you've got to tackle the upstream stuff first. So my understanding is it's still coming in from the, the um, upstream of that, up near the Buskin station and, and the... Um, the, the vineyard areas so we're really dealing with a flow of weed coming in and that's also um, a big part of it is just looking at that strategy because you can't just look at the lake on its own we have to look at the whole system mm. yeah so it's um it's a tough one and do you know we uh probably going a little bit out of scope, but we've had, for example, a really amazing result um, just this last spray season up in one of the lakes up in Rotorua called Lake Okerika. Um, it was heavily infested with lagrosiphon at most sites around the edges there and other weeds too, um, including Egeria. Um, some really consistent good spraying there um, over the years has got that lake to a state that we're going through the final stages of what eradication might look like in that lake which is really exciting but I'm picking you know one lake out of the mix here out of thousands of lakes in New Zealand so it's and it's a small lake it's not anything like being more with inflowing streams and the complexities that you have down there. I yeah. think this yeah no that's all good yeah, it is just a really hard one, Michael. I mean, we, we bounce these ideas around every day, you know, going, you know, what can you do? And, and um, like I said, there is more work being done on different control techniques, but we don't have the right tools in our toolbox at the moment to be able to effectively go into a lake and eradicate those weeds. Sounds like we need some more money. More money, more... <coughs> Genesis. <laughs> Um, before, we? <laughs> well, you could always, need more, on, you always um, use more money. <laughs> Sean, would you like to follow on with that? Sure, sure. Um, so I'm um, 
I'm going to give just a very quick overview of the terrestrial control program. Um, <clears throat> so Tracy's just talked a lot about uh, the aquatic lakes. Um, the terrestrial program is generally based in rivers because uh, a lot of the lens managed parcels are either riverbeds or lake beds. And a lot of people get confused about why we're treating weeds on rivers, but I think to, to the people in this room, we, you, you understand that um, the river parcels are generally land like the one we have in the screen here, which is the Cass River um, going over the bridge to Godley Peak Station. So this is a lens hydro parcel um, and sort of shows that the area that we, um, the areas that we treat. Uh, sorry, on the other screen. Um, so we have, um, sorry, I'm just trying to navigate two screens. Uh, historically, all of our works in the Upper Waitaki were managed by one delivery partner, and that was <clears throat> Boffermiscal Limited. Um, as Tracy said, they still manage our aquatic control program. But we also, um, since receiving our jobs for nature funding, have two other delivery partners in the Upper Waitaki. So um, we have a partnership with Doc Twizel. Um, so that was, sorry, just looking for my too. We've got a partnership with Doc Twizel. Um, this is, they're delivering the South Canterbury um, High Country Jobs for Nature project on our behalf. Uh, this was um, announced by the minister last September uh, at Tikapur. Uh, the main um, two main work streams there are rabbit control and rabbit fencing on crown land. So they're maintaining rabbit fences that were um, on Lynn's managed well, Lynn's pastoral leases that have been handed over to Doc through the tenure review process. But the um, rabbit fences needed maintenance. So there's a combination of rabbit fencing and control, as well as some. Um, um, predator control in the upper Oho catchment, particularly around the Huxley um, Temple um, river systems. So um, there's a network of traps set up there by Doc. They were noticing um, that they the kill was being scavenged by mustelids. So we've put in some additional traps just to target the mustelids to try and um, save the bird life there. And we also have a partnership with uh, Te Manahuna Araki. Um, we contribute funding to uh, their program through Jobs for Nature. Um, so just the Boffer Miscal program, uh, they perform our yearly maintenance at our key sites and uh, any compliance requests that may arise. So uh, for example, we've just had a compliance request um, at uh, the upper Oho catchment for some rabbit control. So we're looking at the options for that now. Um, so in the upper Oho, the looping control um, was took place in the areas shown in the map on the left here. Um, so uh, ECAN do an aerial spray early in the season and then we have ground contractors come through following that and um, pick up any of the remaining weeds. Uh, the lower Oho between um, Lake Oho and Ruatanifa uh, there's lupin, gorse, and broom control takes place there. Um, Tikapur River on the right uh, has been divided into three portions. Um, so Linz manages one third of it, and Doc and Ekan manage the other two thirds of it. And you can see there where the control has taken place, mostly on broom, gorse, um, and again, Russell lupin. Um, the Pukaki River, there was some control on lupin, gorse, and broom between the Pukaki Dam and Tikapur Confluence. And uh, the Dobson predator control that was managed by Boffer Miskel is on the Dobson River. Um, so there's a 25 kilometers on each side of the river, so 50 kilometer trap line, which is a mixture of Dock 200s and 250s, as well as sentinel traps to target possums. Um, so this is the um, newspaper. I just grabbed a screenshot from staff. This is the uh, announcement to the media of the uh, Jobs for Nature projects that we're involved with. So, um, yeah, the Dog Twizel and TMA projects are both funded through the Lynn's Jobs for Nature program as part of the COVID relief package. Um, and this was to create jobs through biosecurity and biodiversity activities. Uh, the McKenzie Basin projects were announced by Minister Damien O'Connor last September. Um, so I've talked about the rabbit fencing and the predator control um, 
but TMA is the other project that we're funding. Uh, we already had a well-established uh, relationship with TMA. Uh, we provided them with tools that they could use to um, monitor their works as they were doing them. Uh, there were applications that were being given to them that they could sort of take photos of weeds um, so that a GPS located them so that they could go back and treat them later. And we also had Boffer Miskel working with TMA to sort of decide where um, the areas that we could should be treating within the TMA project happened. Um, as um, with the Jobs to Nature funding, all of the Boffer Miskel work has been pulled out of the TMA project area because TMA are delivering that work themselves now. Um, so yeah, summary for my slides is again very quick. I wanted to focus to be on the Ligara Siphon, but um, yeah, we used to have our biosecurity program solely delivered by um, Boffer Miskel Limited. Um, since the Johnson Nature funding, the delivery has been diversified among many di different delivery partners, um, especially doc offices and in some cases regional councils, but not in the McKenzie. Um, and due to the unique biodiversity found in the McKenzie Basin, this is an area of high priority to our team. Um, obviously, there's some rivers such as the Godly, um, Tasman, Cass, that are very high biosecurity, uh, sorry, biodiversity um, values. They are very unmodified systems, and um, yeah, we want to look after them. So we're working closely with ECAN and DOC um, on these projects as we all have a shared interest in these sites. So yeah, that was all from me. Um, is there any questions? Okay, thank you. Any questions there for Sean? It's been pretty well explained. I think we certainly aware of what's going on. Um, and I do, do notice that Niwa's now got a main office in, or a large office in Twizel, which has unfortunately had to put off its, its opening to the public, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll have an opportunity to find out more about that down the track too as a committee. Any further comment? Well, thank you for that. We can probably move on to uh, to Shirley, if she's in the background, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Chair of Koto, uh, this is Shirley Hayward. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sorry, I'll just get rid of the cat out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Uh, Oops, hang on, get the technology there. Let me know when you can see that. It's up there now, Shirley. Great, so here, look, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Shirley Hayward. I'm the uh, science team leader for the water quality ecology team. I'm gonna talk, uh, Briefly today about cyanobacteria, the cyanobacteria bloom that's occurred in the Twizel River this year. Um, just a bit of my background, I've been um, supporting uh, ECAN, sorry, I'm just going to get rid of the cat, go away. Supporting um, and involved in ECAN's response to cyanobacteria since it first emerged as an issue in our rivers in the mid 2000s, uh, where we first had reports of dog deaths. Um, deaths in the river. Um, I've been involved in our monitoring response, communications and supporting research to understand uh, what's driving these increase in blooms. So today I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, the history of our cyanobacteria monitoring in the Twizel River, um, what the current understanding is of drivers of blooms and what the possible drivers might be uh, for the bloom this summer in the Twizel River itself. Just in terms of our monitoring program of the Twizel River, uh, there are three sites that we actually have uh, ongoing monitoring. So um, at the picnic area, just uh, outside of the Twizel Township is our summertime contact recreational monitoring site. So that's where we do weekly sampling for E. coli and weekly inspections for cyanobacteria. We also have other sites. Uh, so down at State Highway 8, we do our um, invertebrate monitoring uh, long-term monitoring site there and then right down at the bottom of the river just above the Oho confluence is our long-term water quality monitoring site. 
for uh, nutrients. But today I'm going to focus on uh, the monitoring at the picnic area, but also what our long-term nutrient monitoring has told us about the river as a whole. So this, this graph here just shows, um, actually I might just go back up a bit, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's all cool. Shows the history of the summertime weekly monitoring for cyanobacteria cover in the Twaza River at the picnic area site. And when I talk about cyanobacteria, the focus is on the tax are called formidium, or it's been renamed now as microcolius. And these are the black mats that form on the riverbed. And I'm sure many of you have seen those, although unfortunately more than what you'd like to. Um, the way we assess cyanobacteria risks in our riverbeds are we do a visual inspection of the cover of the weightable reach of the river for the percent cover of cyanobacteria um, and we also assess um, cover of other algal types as well. And what this graph clearly shows, can you see my cursor here? Is that visible? Yes. Yeah, what you can see is in 2009 is when we started monitoring the site um, over summertime and over that 2009 to about 2000 period, very little cyanobacteria, this is percent cover, so less than 5% was generally observed in the Twizel River at that site. 2016, um, some observations of cover increased up to 15%, uh, but again, um, in subsequent years, they remained relatively low. So last summer, 2021, the percent cover from those weekly observations um, kind of got up to 10%. And what's interesting is it became persistent. So there was a long period of, you know, um, of cover of at least 10%. And then this summer, for the first time, we've had a cover reach a 25% uh, cover. In terms of uh, human health warnings, the first threshold that we get concerned about is when you start to get 20% cover, plus you get detaching mats or scums formed at the river edge. And that's <clears throat> reaching a threshold for um, health warnings to be issued. And so uh, when that 25% cover was found in early January, we advised the Canterbury District Health Board, who decided to issue the health warning. That health warning has remained in place because our uh, ongoing monitoring of cyanobacteria at the Twaza River continues to show that the cover fluctuates between uh, 15 to over 20 percent and so that warning remains in place. And so clearly there's been a, a change and an increase. I just want to move on to what our current understanding is of formidium and microcolius blooms and rivers. So there's been a lot of research over the last uh, couple of decades trying to understand what's driven these increased incidents of formidium blooms in our rivers. Um, and it's occurred both in New Zealand, but also internationally as well. And partly it's possibly because of increased monitoring, but uh, there's definitely been a change um, in terms of the extent of blooms and the toxicity of them that particularly results in dog death. And I've had the... Um, an enviable task of uh, contacting, being in contact with many dog owners around uh, where their dogs have become seriously ill or have died as a result of coming in contact with the cyanobacteria in our rivers. Not a pleasant conversation and I understand the heartache that it causes for dog owners when their dogs die from this. So in terms of the, the drivers, the current understanding is flow stability is really important. So um, as a rule of thumb, uh, once you get two weeks of stable flow, the, uh, that increases the risk if other conditions are favourable for cyanobacteria to proliferate. And I guess the one thing I want to perhaps step back and mention is that cyanobacteria such as Formidium microcolius are a natural part of our aquatic ecosystem and they're an important part of that, that uh, food web. Um, but like all good things, uh, once they reach uh, particularly high levels of cover, that's when they cause problems. And so flow stability has been identified as a, an important driver. Warm temperatures, uh, particularly again a rule of thumb, greater than 15 degrees C, can start to uh, create favourable conditions for a bloom of cyanobacteria. Um, and then when it comes to nutrients, so one thing about the Formidium microcolius is that we have observed it 
forming blooms that is more than 20% cover is kind of definition of a bloom. Um, and rivers over a very wide range of nutrient concentrations, in particular over a very wide range of nitrogen concentrations. Uh, but what the studies have shown to date is that uh, you're likely to see a bloom when you've got concentrations above 0.02 milligrams per litre. Now that's a really low threshold and a lot of our rivers, particularly low reaches of our rivers on the Canterbury Plains are well above that threshold. So that simply means that there is ample nitrogen available uh, for bloom formation if other conditions are favourable. One of the interesting things about Formidium microcolius in particular that differentiates it from many other algae that, that proliferate in our river is that it seems to have a, a competitive advantage in low phosphorus environments. And so what it can do in low phosphorus environments, it has a range of strategies for extracting phosphorus out of the environment um, that promotes its growth and can outcompete other algae that require uh, more ongoing inputs of higher concentrations. And the other um, key driver is the input of fine sediment or fine sediment availability. So I just want to take you through this diagram that, that really shows how those drivers influence the development of blooms. And um, in the lower image here, this, this rock, you can see these uh, filaments or strands of, of formidium. This is the colonization phase. And so where the strands are falling on a substrate becoming established. Under these conditions, um, they're favoured by at least moderate to fast flow. They don't need particularly high dissolved phosphorus concentrations, but they do need a bit of nitrogen to get established. Um, the, the potential pressures on those, those algal mats are grazing by invertebrates or floods. But once they become established, they move into this um, mat form um, in the, in the top rock here. Once they reach thick, form thick mats, um, some changes go on within that mat in terms of the chemistry and um, other microorganisms that enable the breakdown of phosphorus within the mats, the, the release of phosphorus from sediments that gets trapped in those mats, and some bacteria present in those mats can also start to fix nitrogen and make it available. So once they're in this mat development stage, the continual growth and development of a bloom is not dependent on the water, overlying water chemistry. It's not dependent on continual inputs of nutrients. It can sustain itself. And it reaches a stage where it's really thick um, and you start to get sloughing off or um, automatic sloughing off of parts of the mats or whole of the mats simply because they reach a level of maturity. They're forming oxygen bubbles during the daytime. They're um, weakening in terms of their attachment to the rock and they start to slough off. Now that's when it becomes a particular problem for um, where the mats form at the edge of the river for dogs in particular who like scavenging around the um, edge of the river and are drawn to those, those scums. And then it goes through a cycle where either a flood has uh, flushed away that material or it's um, just reached the stage of maturity and it's sloughed off. And depending on conditions, particularly uh, temperature, whether it, how quickly it reestablishes. Oops, sorry. How just quickly it for you, um, bloom. Shirley, yeah. just a question for you. That we've had quite a big event of rain event uh, of late, which is probably 130 mils. In the in the in the Twizel, uh, Fraser Dry Stream area, has that made it? Has anybody actually had a look now to see if that's actually flushed some of some of that problem, or what's the story with that? Well, the, they did. Um, our, our field team did a survey two days ago, so on the fifteenth, and they yep. still yep. observed up to fifteen percent cover of cyanobacteria, so it's still present. Right. Um, it is below that twenty percent thresholds, but the warnings generally don't come off until we've had two uh, subsequent measurements of less than 20%. And that's because it can regrow in favorable conditions really quickly. So floods are great, uh, but when you've got other conditions that are really favorable, particularly uh, warm temperatures, yes. uh, they can, the mats can reestablish really quickly. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, just going on to, so what's the nutrient status of Twizel River? So in terms of phosphorus concentration, this is for our long-term monitoring site down at the, the bottom end of the river um, at a site called Below Black Stilt Reserve. 
phosphorus concentrations are generally really low. So I talked about um, the formidium can um, form blooms when you've got less than 0.05 milligrams per litre of dissolved reactive phosphorus. Well, the measured concentrations in the Twazel River are well below that. In fact, often we don't detect this. These bars at this uh, 0.005 is pretty much the limit of laboratory detection. So in terms of the nutrient status, low phosphorus certainly meets that criteria. When it comes to nitrogen, uh, the graph here is showing that there's, there's clearly been a change. So from 2011 to 2017, uh, nitrogen concentrations were really low, um, well below that 0.02 threshold, which uh, indicates the potential for algal blooms or cyanobacteria blooms. From 2018 onwards, clearly there's been a step change in nitrogen concentrations in the river, and that's been uh, likely one of the contributing factors to the potential for bloom formation. Other aspects are flow and temperature. So this is just a hydrograph. The blue line is the flow, um, flow over the last three or four summers. So this is January 2019, uh, 2020, 21 and 22. And what, what's obvious here is that there, particularly after Christmas, there is a period of stable flows or declining in stable flows, um, often after those spring floods. And, and each of those years, uh, there's been, yeah, this, this period of relatively stable flows. This year, um, there was these frequent freshes and then a rapid drop in flow and some period of flow stability. Um, there's been some freshes again, but also the temperatures have been high as well. And so, yeah, well within that threshold that promotes cyanobacteria growth. So in terms of drivers for this Twizel River cyanobacteria bloom, there's certainly been favourable temperatures every summer. Twizel is a fantastically hot place in summer. Uh, there's flow stability that certainly occurs uh, pretty typically after Christmas. Uh, the nutrient status is suitable for a cyanobacteria bloom. That is, it has low phosphorus, um, but high and or high enough uh, nitrogen availability. It's unclear what the role of fine sediment availability has been in the cyanobac in the um, Twizel River. We uh, haven't been able to look at the data in enough detail to see whether that's changed, uh, but it could still be a role of, uh, play a role as well. Will it occur again? So what's uh, what is known is that once you do get a bloom of formidium or microcolius in a river, it's got a greater propensity for re-establishing in subsequent years. So it is likely we all see reoccurrence of cyanobacteria blooms, and particularly when there's those combination of favourable conditions. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a common problem across Canterbury and across um, many of our gravel-fed rivers in New Zealand. So our the main approach is that we need to monitor those popular recreational areas for human health risk. That is over the hundred over hundred sites that we monitor over summertime. Really important that we provide information and educate river users and dog owners to know what to look for and to encourage vigilance at any time and at any place. Where possible, manage activities that reduce the risk of cyanobacteria blooms. So that is. Um, uh, really controlling particularly inputs of nitrogen, controlling uh, activities that might result in increased sediments in rivers that um, have a propensity for cyanobacteria blooms. Communication is really critical. Um, the health warnings that we put out are based on risks to humans. That is, the, the potential for human impacts on humans are, if they come in contact, can cause skin irritations, can potentially exacerbate asthmatic type reactions, uh, can cause stomach upsets if people accidentally ingest some of the mats. But dogs are far more vulnerable. Um, my observations in um, uh, in, in terms of you know, um, where we've had dog deaths or dog illnesses, when we've gone back and looked at that data, it might be as little as 5% cover was present at a time when a dog um, either became ill or died in a particular site. So the, the risks to dogs are far higher. And we simply cannot monitor everywhere. And, and this is a ubiquitous uh, type of cyanobacteria that will grow everywhere. 
or, or in a, a large number of our river systems. So it's really important and our, our communications teams put a lot of effort into developing information for river users and for dog owners so they know what to look for. That's it, thank you. Any questions? Questions, anyone? I think it's pretty pretty well explained. Thank you, Shirley. I think there's no doubt that we need to be monitoring more uh, on this river. I think further up, uh, Ericon has been doing um, some monitoring for quite a few years now, so it'd be interesting. I'd, I'd like to have a look at some of those figures um, to see right. the trends in that as well. Yeah, so, yeah, there's a pretty clear, clear pattern that there has been a change in, in the river and the catchment. Um, but yes, we can look from, in more detail at what's happening, where, whether that's a partic particular locality or not. Yeah, so has Elizabeth got a question there? Is that uh, coming through? Oh, I can see yes. that, right. So uh, the question is, how is our progress on determining the relative contribution of nutrient input versus water volume versus climate change for each of the affected rivers? Very difficult to tease out the, uh, the relative drivers. Um, we know that, that the combination of those favourable conditions can create the um, conditions for a bloom formation. It's highly variable though. Um, climate change is inevitably going to be a contributor because it's going to extend the period of favourable water temperatures um, and possibly also have influence on that hydrology and particularly flow stability. Uh, that second question, how are we adjusting land use guidelines and water consumption limits to compensate for climate change warming in order to protect rivers? That is a very good question. Yes, that, question, that, that question is just about your, um, you just showed that nitrate was um, going up very rapidly in the Twisdall River. Where is that nitrate coming from? And can we adjust that in order to protect our river? Well, that's, that's a good question. So where is it coming from? Uh, there's, there's been, I guess, agricultural development in various parts of that catchment over the last decade. Uh, it's very difficult uh, not to, well, very diff well, when you get that sort of agricultural development intensification or increased productivity, inevitably, uh, across, the, particularly in Canterbury, we will see increase in nitrogen concentrations in the receiving environments. On mm. top of that, too, um, there's been the alders all the way down the, from the canal, basically down to Twizel, have completely uh, taken over all the banks all the way down too. So there's a lot more um, in the way of, of, you know, herbage all the way down the river, which used to be a very clear river. So yeah. that came from Lake Puaka. So that, that's another thing. There's, there's several things. You're right. I think um, we, it's putting your finger on which, which one's causing it. That's the thing, Shirley. Really... That's right. And look, that's to, what yeah, we to, need to do. Yeah, and there's still, there's still um, large uncertainty. I mean, even though I gave you some of those figures around sort of known conditions that promote, that, that can enable cyanobacteria bloom, there is uncertainty around those as well, and what some of the other drivers are too. Julie, is there really any way to get to rid of it? We down that uncertainty. Sorry. Yeah. Michael just asked if there's a way of getting rid of it. Did you hear that, Julie? Or... Uh, um, no, there's, there's no tool available um, other than um, ensuring that floods are allowed and able to pass through. So. So the two main mechanisms by which the blooms dissipate is through a flood um, passing through, and particularly once the temperatures get cooler into autumn, those growth rates slow, and so you don't really get a re-establishment of a bloom once a decent flood has come through in the cooler conditions. And also once the mats become mature enough, they just uh, slough off uh, themselves, and uh, it's a little bit unclear about why sometimes they re-establish and sometimes they don't. But, but it, look, it's a formidium microcolius. It's been a natural part of our ecosystem. Um, certainly my observations, I've seen it in rivers well over 20 years ago. So it's always been there. The, the question is why 
and why is it able to dominate and proliferate uh, and what can we do to manage that? We had a very prolonged autumn, didn't we? And, and at very low flows last year. So, you know, all those things have some effect, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. And look, in other river systems, uh, what's been really surprising is these long autumns these sort of milder autumns, we've had mm -hmm. health warnings in place and other rivers like the Ashley Selwyn and the Opehi well into May and even June some years because of the, that changing uh, climatic conditions. All we can do is ask for some more monitoring. I think we definitely need that. And I think there's some being done anyway by, by you know, the locals. So any of that we can pull together would be helpful. So we'll certainly work on that. Yeah, but, but look, uh, that's right, and increase and, and supporting researchers. So uh, particularly Cawthron and Susie Wood have led New Zealand's research and uh, at least uh, got it to the stage where we have a current level of understanding. So supporting that research is really important. But, but what's so critical is the communication. Because we've got limited tools in the toolbox for managing or constraining balloons, it's really important that river users understand those risks and, and know what to look for. Matt, you've got a question? No, in the interest of time, Simon, I was just sharing an opinion, which is uh, I'm not comfortable just sitting and watching this worsen. No. Um, it feels to me, when you think about our objectives of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, this feels like a fail on multiple fronts. Mahingakai, recreational amenity, biodiversity, so probably a conversation when we're reviewing our action plan is what what deliberate uh, action can the zone committee take to address this? Totally agree. Thank you for that. Thank you. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Shirley. Um, we, our facilitator is, is on board. Is, is that correct? Or well, not today? I, I am uh, on board. Uh, so we'll move on to the, uh, the action plan budget. So right. Janine's done this report. I um, hope you've had a chance to read it. Um, she has uh, three recommendations in there. Um, and the first one is that we, uh, it's the committee recommends to Environment Canterbury um, that budgets be allocated to those first two proposed projects of the Ormarama Stream and the Orho Conservation Trust Lake Middleton Willow Control um, for $21,000 and $11,000, uh, excluding GST. Um, do we want to discuss those first? Would that be? I think that's appropriate. I think probably, yep. shall we do um, Ormarama Stream? Um, yep. Pity that uh, we haven't got Richard here this to talk about that, but who, sure. who would like to start the conversation off of that? We'll throw it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I've read the report. I guess you, you've all had a chance to read the report. Yeah. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, the project does seem to have backing of, uh, you know, multiple parties, including ECAN. Um, and um, it seems like it will, to me, make, you know, potentially make it, it good difference to um, the leaching of nutrients. Um, so really it's uh, down to the zone committee, does this fit with your action plan priorities? Um, do you think it's money well spent? Um, I was too slow to hit my unmute button. Sorry, Dave, Simon, <laughs> but I'll just, I'll, I support this. Um, this, if we go back to our uh, zone implementation plan, um, we, we were committed to support our farming community, you know, take affirmative action. Um, it, this to me just, uh, in fact, the Amarima Stream Water Users Group is is a showcase for getting, you know, uh, a farming our farming community to converge and take affirmative action. So I'm very, I'm very much in support of this and I think it could actually you know, represent a template or a model that would be we'd be followed elsewhere in the catchment where we need um, uh, action by this community taken. Thanks for that, Matt. It, 
it's definitely it's trying to get those catchment groups together and that that one catchment group that's making some real progress and i think um i certainly wholeheartedly support it anybody else like to make comment yeah i i've uh stood about here I, I would endorse matt's um comments it's definitely a, a template that to be used throughout our regions I mean, uh, yeah i'd like to go ahead thank you and equally i endorse it after the work that has happened in that catchment uh, the challenges that we have through the Ahari and, and down into the uh, flow on effect. So anything that we can do at the top of the catchment to, to improve the, the system right through, I think is really, really helpful. And it follows on from the, the good work that has happened. Gets my vote, Simon. Thanks, Joy. Um, just uh, wondering if Michael, you can make comment of it. It's probably not in your, your little corner, but I mean, it's certainly, uh, are you happy with what's going on here? He mightn't be with us, does he? Anyway, I, I mean, it, it, I think we, we could move ahead on that. Shall we, shall we move with the move that that gets approved um, and, and do that now, then move on to the next, uh, which is O House. So would somebody like to move that? I'll move uh, that, Simon. Thanks, Joy. A second of that. I'll second. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Right. Oh, how? Oh, how? Yes. Um, again, you have a report in there um, from Viv, and Viv is here today if we have any questions around it. Um, I do have one question with um, reading through that when the money is going to be spent. Um, we have a budget that goes up to the end of June and then we'll be looking at a new budget for next year which we can't actually commit to as a committee until we're into that new year. So my question is how much of this money will be spent in this financial year up to the end of June? Um, yes, hello. Um, when I spoke to Janine, um, she was of the opinion that uh, the money, well, I'm not sure how she was going to arrange it, the money could be paid and then it would be spent in the next financial year. Um, oh. I'm not sure what those arrangements are for that. Um, yep. But obviously we need to time the spending of the money for the most optimal time to control the willows and that would be into the next financial year because it's um, December through to February. I would imagine you would have some money to spend on planning and stuff in this financial year as well? Uh, so yes, would... obviously there's some work to be done to um, look at uh, what the control measure will be and just assess um, that work, which yes, can be carried out up until June, um, but the yeah. bulk of the spending would be in your next financial year. Then I think we can probably do what Janine's suggesting then, to make sure you have the money to get you started and carry on through. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dave. I think Viv, the only other one that probably we probably should look at is that those willows do do afford a, a certain amount of shade, and that replanting those areas with something like native, you know, the native beech, that which is quite prevalent up around the Ohau area, um, some replanting. I mean, we, it's already well uh, killing the willows, but we do need some more shade around there. So it'd be nice to have a process where those beech were. Uh, some nice beach or something was put in so that we got something growing straight away. Um, uh, what's your thoughts on that, Tiff? Um, yes, absolutely agreed. Um, so this this project concentrates on the the smaller willows that are spreading um, around the lake, so to, to clean them up. It isn't the large willows that are along no. the, the causeway area. Um, and you may remember I've spoken or about um, the Conservation Trust, we have a, um, some funding to do a stage one sort of master plan, get that underway for Lake Middleton. So that would include what you're talking about, Simon, looking to, well, where do we need to do more planting and when that will happen and who will do it. So um, in a way, this is preparing the ground for that next stage is to work out, well, then, you know, how do we replant and when it happens and those sort of things. 
thank you very much. I think that's just something that you bear in mind for next year's budget as well. I think it's really good that we, it's already well, you know, we, we will have to take those old willows out in time. And I think it's great that we start thinking about getting natural, some natural shelter around there from native trees would be quite nice. Yes, no, absolutely agree. It would be wonderful. Has anybody got any other comments about this project? Everybody's very quiet, but somebody like to move Renee. that we move with this. Sorry, was that somebody? Yeah, it's Renee here from Waiho. Um, Thank you. I uh, I shared this, of course, with our executive, and I just had a couple of queries uh, that I've been asked to inquire about. Um, it states under project method um, that it was advised that an ecologist from Eking could undertake the ecological survey along with a local Orunanga representative. Um, is, who, I think they're querying who Takiwa this fall in. Are you aware of that? Because it could be more than one representative. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, uh, Maureen and uh, Renee, it's um, both here. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I understand that there's three Unaka that have an interest here. So yes, that, that should be plural. Um, awesome. Yeah. Thank you and well, welcome board, Renee. Thank you. Any more comment about that project? If not, would somebody like to move, please? I shall move if no one else is. Thank you, John. I'll second it. Thanks, Joy. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Okay, we've got those dealt with. Thank you for that. Thank you for your help to um, move those things along. I can see that we, we probably would be looking at some of these things further down the track with some more opportunities of, of getting it back to its, its more of its original native um, fauna and flora. Uh, what about general business? Have we got any more on there, uh, Dave? What's the story? Have you had these um, So just looking at um, Janine's other recommendations there, um, she was also saying, also saying that the committee agrees that uh, the remainder of the budget is allocated to the remaining three projects listed in Upper Waitaki CWMS Action Plan. So that's that table. So there's um, conservation efforts around Lake Alexandrina, youth engagement through the Mokuhi uh, workshop and the additional hangi and twizel and the, the wānanga with local runanga to install a po signifying the importance of the area uh, that a session is held at. So we're looking at another uh, four, eight, another 15,000 there. So um, I guess there's not a lot of detail on those, but what Janine's asking for is uh, that the committee recommends that the budget would be spent on those three areas. So how do people feel about that? Um, this year's budget, I mean, it's got, we haven't got any other projects coming up in the short term. And I think that that's um, pretty much what was, what was envisaged for this season to try and get things moving. Um, right. And have some projects ready for next, ready for um, agreeing with you know next next season. So, um, what's what's people's thoughts on that? Stuart, do you yeah. have a question? I, John, I was just going to say that fits with the conversation I think we've had in the past of, of those engagements and practices that we wanted to put in place. That's how I understand it. Did Stuart, did you have a, some comments, Mike? Or yeah, no, I'm fine with that. It's yeah, like John said, it's what we've discussed during the year, so um, I'm quite happy with those. Happy to go with that as well. Yeah, that's right. Can I, can I ask a question, Simon? Um, what happens if we don't actually achieve one of these things? What happens to the money? Does it? I've forgotten what is said about that. Do we lose it, or does it roll over, or? Um, my understanding is we do lose it, um, yeah. so we want we want to make sure we spend it. So um, I think 
Janina, we're working with you to refine this as we get closer to the end of financial year, and um, we'll be looking to hit it, you know, hit it bang on if we can. Great, thank you. Thanks, Roy. I think we can. We we don't need to move on that, do we? Or we just make do we just make a recommendation that we carry on with those projects? Yes, I think if we make that recommendation, that'd be good. Yep. Okay. Well, we, so has somebody noted that? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to do that, Simon. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm taking the, I'm taking the minutes, Simon. So that's fine. No, that's great. That's great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any further general business? Nothing at the moment. I think everybody can move on and hopefully go out and enjoy the good day. But um, Renee, it's, it's welcome on board. I, I didn't realise you were listening and it's wonderful to have somebody else on the committee. We're really, really looking forward to that. Um, if, if you would like to give us a character to say goodbye, then we really look forward to meeting you next time you, you, uh, we have our meeting. Is Renee not with us anymore? No, I am. So, <laughs> she is. <laughs> my, my, I've, to do that? I've had very, very many issues. <laughs> this morning. That's all right. Are you happy to do that for us? That would be lovely. <laughs> right. Yep. Ooh, good Sorry. My mind's just gone blank. I don't do well. Mm. Okay. Kia ora, ka manaki taka, a te mea karo, ki ruka, ki tena, ki tena o tato, kia mahia te hua makihi kihi, kia toe te kupu, tule te mana, tule te aroha, toe te reo Māori, tuturu whakamoa, ka kia tina, tina, kue taiki. Taiki, ei. Thank you very much. Sure.